Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jenna and I work with Mellonport and I'm here today to um, tell you that Mellonport will not exist by DEF CON 5. So I would like to start with a quick question to the audience. Who knew already before that Mellonport would not uh, stick around for a couple more years? One, two, three, this is the Mellonport team. Okay, so not so many. <laughs> um, that's normal because um, Mellonport is actually one of the first DAP um, protocol which is going to wind down the company that built it after two years of development uh, and completely let go of the control of the protocol. So really, um, Mellonport is a Swiss-based company that was mandated uh, in February 2017 for the development of the Mellon Protocol. And uh, Mellonport took the commitment to wind down the company uh, once the protocol would be ready to deploy it on the mainnet. So uh, in February 2019, which is two years later, uh, in a couple of months from now, we are going to deploy to the mainnet, wind down the company, and decentralize the um, the, the governance and future maintenance of the protocol. So really what this presentation is about is how can we get rid of Mellonport? Uh, or in other words, um, how do we make it so that the Mellon protocol uh, can be self-sustainable and succeed without the existence of the company that initially built it? So uh, this is uh, threefold. The first part, uh, we're gonna talk about how can we create a healthy ground for network effects? Uh, then we're gonna see how do we provide uh, the proper economic incentives uh, for the participants in the network. And the third part is um, the governance and maintenance framework that we put in place uh, to support the future of the Mellon protocol. So uh, first, uh, what is Mellon? I'm gonna give a quick Mellon 101 for the people not familiar uh, with the Mellon protocol. So Mellon is an open source protocol for on-chain asset management. It allows uh, anyone to set up and manage a fund uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, so technically what it is, it is a set of rules implementing the behavior of an investment fund um, as a set of smart contracts. So another way to um, understand what Mellon is is to see how you would actually create a fund uh, on our platform. So it's very simple, it takes a few seconds. Uh, you go on the platform, give your fund a name, uh, select the exchanges that you want your fund to be uh, allowed to trade with, um, then you're gonna be able to uh, define your fee structure, so that is the management and performance fee are your, of your fund. Um, so just as in the traditional world, except that here, the, uh, this is encoded in the smart contracts. Um, then you will also have the possibility to uh, configure your risk management profile. So those are um, pre-trade clearance rules that are going to be encoded in the smart contracts and enforced uh, by the blockchain. So it can be, you know, maximum number of position. It could be price tolerance, um, maximum concentration. You could have, uh, you could whitelist assets. You could blacklist assets if you want to give the guarantee to your investors that you're not gonna trade uh, anything dodgy. Um, and then, really, um, you're gonna have the overview of your um, the, the rule set that you defined. And as soon as you hit create fund, you're actually gonna be uh, deploying a fund to the Ethereum blockchain. So, really, on the blockchain, how does it look like? Um, you get what we call a technology-regulated and operated fund. So it is a set of smart contracts, um, and each contract is a component of the fund. So you have a component that takes care of the internal accounting and NAV calculation. You have a component that takes care of uh, the fee calculation and distribution. You have a component that takes care of the trading, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you, as a fund manager on top, um, you control your fund and can make various interactions, such as trading, on behalf of your investors. Um, so you can have external investors on the left that can come in and directly invest uh, in your fund by calling a function in the participation component. And um, your fund, uh, the valuation of your fund is gonna be calculated on-chain using on-chain prices that we get uh, from the Kyber network. Um, and then the other external interaction that you have are the decentralized exchanges that you can trade with. Uh, so right now we have integrated Oasis DEX, uh, Zero X, and Kyber, and we have the Ethernex integration coming up soon. So that's how a fund looks like 
um, on the blockchain. And what I think is really nice is that in the past two years, we have seen uh, an explosion of open source finance protocols. And Melon comes nicely on top of that and nicely integrates and um, connects those different protocols. So Melon allows you to manage crypto assets, um, trade on decentralized exchanges. Uh, in the future, we envision integration with uh, credit, uh, lending, on-chain margin, derivatives, uh, all those type of new protocols uh, that we've seen. And uh, we have also people working on blockchain-based identity systems, which is um, really important if you want to be able to identify the investors in your fund. So that's for the Melon 101. So now we can actually get into the subject of today. Um, so when we design um, a system that needs to be self-sustainable and decentralized, um, what you really want to do is identify the different stakeholders that you have in your network and make sure that your model um, you know, caters to the needs of each of your stakeholders. So for in our case, we have a couple of stakeholders and they are the token holders, um, the project and developers who build on top of Melon. We have the users um, and we have uh, the maintainers, the people who are going to make decisions in the future uh, for the protocol. So throughout this presentation, we're going to see how we make sure that we, um, that we cater to the needs of all of those stakeholders. So first of all, we want to be able to maximize the network effect. Um, in the past couple of months, we have seen um, more and more projects reaching out to us, uh, projects and team wanting to build uh, new things on top of Melon. And that is really cool. It doesn't really come as a surprise to us because asset management has a lot of use cases. We are focusing on the hedge fund use case, but you can have um, VC funds, pension funds, insurance funds. Uh, we also have people working on the gamification of asset management. Um, and it, it's, it's really nice, but the problem is that each of these projects um, needs to get funding. And what they plan to do, rightfully so, is to uh, run another ICO to get funding. And what you get with that is that you get different projects sharing the same underlying infrastructure, but each of that project has a token, a token economic, a different governance system, a different maintenance system. So you have one infrastructure, but isolated um, isolated sub-ecosystems. And that, we believe, is um, not great because we think isolation brings inefficiencies. So if we, have, if we find a way to... Um, to actually have synergies uh, between those projects and to make it so that they can share more than just the infrastructure, we believe that all of our ecosystem could benefit from uh, economies of scale. So um, uh, earlier this year, we decided to open up the Melon token to other teams and other projects um, in order to, to, to benefit from synergies. So basically, the Melon token has a yearly inflation pool, which is a fixed amount of token that gets uh, minted each year. And uh, this inflation pool is going to be used to, uh, to fund different things. So the first thing is uh, compensating developers who complete MIPs, which are Melon uh, Improvement Proposal inspired by the Ethereum EIPs. Uh, so if you're a developer and you see that there is this uh, feature, you're like, yeah, I think this is cool, I want to solve that problem, or I want to make this integration, you can do it and get compensated in Melon for that. The second thing is um, for a project who want to build on Melon and who need to get funding, instead of doing an ICO, what they could do is um, make a funding request to the Melon governance system. Uh, and if the governance system agrees, that could, they could get their funding through the Melon inflation pool. Um, and the third thing is a little bit more exotic, I would say, and maybe a little bit more forward uh, thinking. Uh, those are token swaps and token mergers, inspired by what, what happened very often in, in the traditional uh, investment banking world. So um, uh, in the case of a token swap, it would be the case where you have a project that already has a token, and um, we identify uh, potential synergies between Melon and that other project. If that other project has a smaller, smaller market cap than Melon, what we could do, provided that uh, both governance systems pre-agree to it, um, 
This project could burn all of their token, and in exchange, they could get Melon token. And we kind of like join forces uh, between the two projects and create a stronger and uh, bigger ecosystem. And the last thing is the token, uh, the token merger request. So that is the case that you have another project that has another token, but it's like a project of a similar size, similar uh, market cap. And in that case, this would not require uh, anything from the inflation, actually. It would just require both projects to actually just um, burn their tokens in order to create a new token uh, that encompasses both uh, economies and both communities. So um, opening up the Melon token allows us to benefit from synergies, um, but also to, to align the interests of the participants across the networks. So this part um, caters to the needs of the projects and developers uh, that build on top of Melon. So now that we have seen how to maximize network effects, uh, we actually compensate people with Melon tokens, we need to make sure that we build in the right, um, the right economic mechanism in the token so that the token is actually um, something that is desirable from those developers. So that is providing proper economic incentives. So um, this relates to the token economic design. So when we were working on that, we really had uh, three goals in mind that we wanted to uh, fulfill. So the first one was ensuring that the Melon token uh, would be desirable and would have uh, integrity uh, in order to be able to provide proper economic incentives to the user and developer needs of the network. And uh, last but not least, we also wanted to avoid the pitfalls of the high velocity token model, which is uh, a problem that has been um, written a lot about by different people, such as Vitalik or Chris Berniski or others. We um, published a very long and detailed blog on that, if you are uh, interested on that part. So with these goals in mind, um, our solution uh, to the token economics is called the Melon Engine. So um, let's take just a step back. Um, when you use, uh, when you interact with a smart contract on Ethereum, you pay, uh, e you pay gas to the Ethereum network. And that gas is calculated as the number of gas units that are consumed by the function that you're calling, and uh, that is multiplied by the Ethereum gas price, right? So we came up with the idea that when you interact with Melon smart contracts, in addition to paying gas to the Ethereum network, you're also going to pay what we call the asset management gas, and you're going to pay that to the Melon network. So the way it's calculated is very uh, similar to how it's done on Ethereum. So we take the same number of gas units uh, that are consumed uh, by the function on the EVM, and instead of multiplying that by the Ethereum gas price, we multiply it by the Melon gas price or the asset management gas price. So how does it look in more details? So you're a user, and you're about to use um, some Melon smart contracts on Ethereum. So we impose that asset management gas on certain functions, not all of them because we want to stay uh, cheap, affordable, and um, competitive compared to other alternatives. So on a few functions, uh, you're going to pay your gas to the Ethereum network as usual. And in, in addition to that, you're also going to pay your asset management gas to the Melon network. And instead of paying that gas, and this is really important here, instead of paying that gas in Melon, you're going to pay that gas, the asset management gas, in Ether. That Ether is sent to the Melon engine smart contract. And that contract is very simple. It only does two things. The first thing is that when it receives Ether from the user interaction, it's going to sell this, this Ether and buy Melon at a premium on the market. So it's basically a contract that is a unidirectional liquidity contract. Um, it's a contract that is a market itself. So it's going to sell the ETH, buy Melon at a premium. And once, once it has Melon in the contract, it's just going to burn those Melons. So sending them to a probably unaccessible address, um, you know how, how that works. So um, what we have here is that when the network is used, uh, absent inflation, the um, melon total supply uh, is going to be decreasing. So this mechanism gives us two very nice things. The first thing is we manage to reduce friction 
inconvenience and cost uh, on the user because instead of having to uh, own Melon and uh, Ether when you, when you use Melon on Ethereum, you only need as, as a user to have Ether just as if you were you know, using any smart contract on Ethereum. And the second thing, and arguably much more important, is that we manage to align the token value with the usage of the network. And we do that without having a high velocity token model. So that's really, uh, really important. We think that we're the first uh, DAP protocol to have managed to do something like that. Uh, so we are very uh, proud of our work uh, there, and I encourage anyone who is interested to read uh, the Melanomics 2 piece that we wrote about that. So um, that part, as you might have understood by now, takes care of the token holders. So it seems like the token holders are interested by uh, the re return on investment on the token, and if the, the network is successful, uh, this mechanism should cater, uh, and should cater to the needs of the token holders and please them. So now that we've seen how to maximize network effects and to pro provide proper um, economic incentives, uh, the last part that we need to go through is the governance and maintenance system of Melon. So when Melonport is going to disappear in February uh, 2019, we need to have a way uh, to make decisions for the future of the protocol. So that's what we're going to see now. So um, first of all, when um, when designing the system, we really ask ourselves, okay, why are we doing that? Like, what are the goals that we want this governance uh, model to, um, to, to complete, basically? So those are threefold as well. So the first one is that we want to preserve the integrity and security of the network. It's extremely important when you're speaking about asset management. The second thing is that we want to maximize user adoption and protect protect the user as much as possible. <clears throat> and the, thir the third thing is that we want to foster innovation in order to uh, make the network more attractive. So how do we do that? So when I talked about our uh, different stakeholders in, in the space, um, we're going to talk about this again now. So when you're building a governance model, I think that really what you want to do is identify what is the most vulnerable stakeholder group in your ecosystem? And uh, so that's how we worked. Um, our most vulnerable group are the users here. So the users are the people who manage uh, Melon Fund, so asset managers, and uh, also the investors who are invested in those Melon Funds. So um, from this assumption that the users are the most vulnerable, we worked out a model that is uh, user-centric, so really focused on protecting the user, but also uh, making sure that their voices uh, are heard, uh, and <coughs> sorry, and will be heard in the future. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that the users would be supported by um, technically skilled people. So, so we come up with a user-centric and skill-based governance model. So how does that look? Um, so I introduce you to now, uh, the Mellon Council now. Um, so the Mellon Council is a body that is going to be responsible for the future development and maintenance of the Mellon Protocol. It is composed of two subgroups. The first one is the Mellon Technical Council. So this is a group of technically skilled people or people who have uh, expertise on the Mellon Protocol or other uh, finance-related protocols on Ethereum, um, or people who have uh, contributed um, to the Melon code base in the past. So um, th this subgroup is going to be responsible for the technical parts of uh, the decisions that we're going to have to make in the future. The second subgroup is what we call the MEB representatives. So those are the Melon exposed businesses. So this is a self-organized entity that um, where you will have all of the users who can uh, you know, prove that they are users of the network, either by um, proving that they have assets under management, subsequent assets under management on Melon, or proving that they have used this amount of asset management gas over the past year. Um, so this uh, group is going to be able to elect uh, among themselves uh, their representatives for, uh, to sit on the Melon Council together with 
the Mellon Technical Council members. So with this, um, with this Mellon Council, what we hope to achieve is that um, by combining uh, the uh, user representation and people who are technically skilled and informed, we hope that we are able to make um, the best decisions possible for, for the protocol and for the users of Mellon. So how does that uh, work? How, does, how do we form the council? So I told you how the Mellon Exposed Businesses is formed. Um, for the Mellon Technical Council, it's a little bit different. So um, in February 2019, Mellonport is going to assign um, five, to set, five to seven seats uh, for the Mellon Technical Council uh, to external people, uh, to people that we believe have the... Um, the skills or expertise to, uh, to do that, and also uh, the ethical standards uh, that, that go with it. So uh, we're going to assign the initial seats. And then from there on, um, the council is going to be able to self-expand, so to grow by itself, uh, based on the consensus of its members, um, following a 5 to 2 ratio. So for five uh, Mellon Technical Council members, we'll be able to have two MEB representatives. Um, it's worth noting here that the Mellon Technical Council are going to be compensated uh, with Mellon token from the inflation pool that are going to be vested um, over a couple of uh, years. Um, and that those people are, are known. So we know who they are. Uh, their identities are uh, revealed. So now, what, is, uh, what are the responsibilities of that council, you might be wondering. So those are three also. The first one are protocol upgrades. Um, the Mellon code base uh, will need to evolve from February onwards. So the Mellon council is going to be responsible for uh, deploying new contracts uh, and most importantly, managing the ENS subdomain names uh, that point to the official Mellon contracts. Um, important to note here, all upgrades are opt-in only, which means that the user will never be forced into an upgrade, and it will require explicit and voluntary action from the user to, um, to upgrade to new contracts. So the, the second thing are resource allocation. Um, so as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, we have the inflation pool, which can be used for various things, and the Mellon Council is going to be are responsible for making decisions as to what to fund or not, which project to uh, to to accept um, in as a funding request or a token swap or merger, etc. So that's going to be a Mellon Council responsibility. And the last one are network parameters. So I um, when when I presented the Mellon engine, I mentioned the asset management gas price, and um, what I didn't say is that this is actually a variable that we can change and that we can adjust. So based on our financial modeling, it is not expected that this asset management gas price would need to change very often. Actually, it, I think it would be quite rare uh, because um, it's expected that market dynamics will uh, adjust, uh, will make you know, natural adjustments, but we can't predict um, there are some scenarios that we can't really predict. So we want to have the option to adjust the gas price, um, basically to reduce it in two cases. Uh, the first one is if there is a network usage spike overnight, you might want to reduce the gas price. And the second one is market volatility. So here we're exposed to the Mellon ETH price, but also the ETH USD price. So the Mellon USD price. And if there is extreme market conditions or volatility, you might want to reduce the, the asset management gas price in order to stay affordable for the user and competitive compared to other alternatives. So that part um, on the governance caters to um, the maintainers of the network and to the users as you might have understood by now. So to wrap up, um, our model, both token economic and governance, uh, addresses uh, the needs of all of the stakeholders. Um, we maximize network effect by opening up the Mellon token so that we can align interest, uh, uh, participant interest across the network. And um, we manage to have a token model that is um, aligning the token value with the usage of the network. And finally, we uh, recognize that the users are the most important 
the really the key player in our ecosystem. Without users, uh, at the end of the day, we fail. So we uh, designed a system that uh, makes sure that the users are valued properly and supported by technical skills. So um, with that, I would like to um, announce that the Mellon Technical Council applications start today. Um, so, so really, the Technical Council is, is supposed to be inclusive and open. So if uh, there are excellent developers who have the skills or feel uh, like competent for, for that role, uh, we would be really happy to receive um, applications. So you can reach out to mtc at melonport.com. But all of the Melonport, the Melonport team is here. Everyone is wearing leather jackets. So if you want to reach out in person, uh, use DEF CON for that. We would be very happy as well. So um, this was uh, the last Melonport presentation. Uh, it's, it, it was an honor for me to, to do that. Um, Melonport will not exist by DEF CON 5. Uh, but that doesn't mean the, that it's the end of Melon. It's actually just the beginning, I believe. So thank you, and I think we can applaud the Mellon team for the incredible work to make this a reality. Thank you.